this point, there are several documents either in process or already published that allow us to have some guidelines on the, the diagnosis and treatment of hereditary angioedema and now acquired angioedema and C1 inhibitor uh, types that are not classical. So the, the primary one that I think that everybody should be aware of really is the Ciccardi. Marco Ciccardi convened a, a group of people internationally in Garniano, Italy, and it's called the Hawk document. It's an international consensus document about the diagnosis and treatment of HAE. And Dr. Teresa Caballero also produced a consensus document based out of a, a meeting in Hungary about two years ago. But the, her article was published about January of 2012. And her focus was not on the overview of, of hereditary angioedema, but more on women, women and children, pregnant women. So the special considerations we have to take into consideration regarding women. And at this point in time, there's at least two other documents that I'm aware of. One is the Joint Task Force, the American College of Allergy, Asthma and Immunology, and the Academy of Allergy, Asthma and Immunology, uh, IACI, and the WAO uh, are involved in, in this as well. The Joint Task Force is in process, and the, there's an international consensus document on angioedema, hereditary and non-hereditary angioedema, such as acquired or ACE inhibitor induced. So those two documents are in press or recently published, such as the ICON document just within the last couple of days. So they all address the issue of diagnosis and management and special considerations in different populations, including children. There, a consensus means an agreement by the majority. There's not a uniform agreement on most of these issues. I, I should say there's not a uniform agreement in some of the issues. It, generally speaking, there's agreements that since we have all these great new treatments to manage hereditary angioedema, uh, we now have the dilemma of selecting which patient should get what treatment, and sometimes no treatment. But again, the whole focus, because we have this great dilemma now of choice, is choosing the best treatment for each individual patient. So that means we have to assess how severe the disease is, how frequent it is, where the attacks occur, where the patient lives, their access to medication and treatment providers, their insurance, what that will cover, uh, the sex, because the treatment of women and children different than for men. Androgens have, throughout my lifetime and my career, been the classical treatment for chronic hereditary angioedema. It has side effects, androgens, the attenuated androgens do. They work, they're inexpensive, but they have side effects and we should use the lowest dose of that and all medicines to treat chronic diseases. Some people cannot be good candidates for androgens. Women, in my opinion, are not the best candidates for androgens, but especially women who are pregnant or breastfeeding should not have androgens. And that is one of the consensus guideline recommendations as well. Children should not have androgens if they're pre-tanner stage five because of the effect on the growth and, and so on. So there's good consensus on these issues. Which patient, how severe is severe, how frequent is frequent, et cetera. Those parameters are not totally agreed upon by, by the people who have attended these consensus meetings. Direct head-to-head -head studies are lacking as well. So we're, we're using expert opinion, not necessarily pure science, but expert opinions um, with experts like Dr. Ciccardi, Dr. Bork, Dr. Lumley, Dr. Zura, Dr. Banerjee, and, and Dr. Riddell, many other people from the United States and also around the world, such as Dr. Caballero, Dr. Farkas, and Dr. Longhurst. So we have a lot of extensive experience leading to these consensus documents. So I agree with most of the points in the consensus documents. And so I think we need to use these guidelines as guidelines, not necessarily as science, and personalize and tailor the treatment to each patient based upon their desires and the frequency and severity of the attack in their past history. There's always gaps. The more we learn, the more we know we don't know. I mean, I, I've learned more about HAE the last several years than I knew the previous 30 years, in part because we have better science and better medicines at this point. There are specific gaps that need to be addressed. One, short-term prophylaxis. We don't have any licensed medicines for that in this country, so that's, that's an unmet need. 
And the proper treatment in women is, is a little uncertain other than the caveats that I just discussed as far as avoidance of, of certain medicines, androgens and antifibrinolytics during pregnancy, okay? So that's, and, and in children who are less than, than 10 or stage five, certainly less than 12 years of age, we don't have any indicated medicine in this country. Now we can use them off-label, we can use a compassionate need, but the FDA has not approved any medicine for less than 12 year olds in this country. So that's, that's a dilemma right there as well. So I think those are unmet needs that we really need to pursue to increase our, our approach to this disease and improve our approach to this disease. The international guidelines are pretty uniform in recommending that most patients need to have on-demand therapy available. In fact, all patients should have on-demand therapy available if they have HAE. And many times, probably most times, that's sufficient in the management of their disease. But not always, and that's where the personalization or the individualization of, of patient selection and treatment need to coalesce. We need to pick out patients who are not doing well with just occasional, random, infrequent, non-severe attacks and put them on some sort of prophylaxis if they meet the criteria for prophylaxis in other ways, such as women versus men, children versus adults, and so on. So another point is that if they are on prophylaxis of any sort, they still need to have on-demand therapy available. So prophylaxis works, but not 100%, so they need on-demand therapy of, of several different types that we have available at this time.